so many things to to see and do. <laughs> okay, all righty. Um, so once again, welcome everyone. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, joining us. And uh, we do look forward to sharing some great information today with you. And uh, also just having the opportunity to uh, see your faces and to um, you know, know that you are also excited um, to be here and, and learn from each other. That is our goal with this group. So thank you so much. Uh, Julia Wicker does send her apologies. She had um, you know, a trip that she had to make with her husband and um, she couldn't be here today. Um, they are showing livestock and um, she's always uh, out there trying to help him as well. So um, she does send her condolences for that purpose. Um, so. Let's get started on our update. And so at this point, if we um, could have you um, just put your questions in the chat, if you have um, any questions and stay muted and off camera for the uh, three presentations that we will be having. And then um, later on, we will have an opportunity to um, get more acquainted with each other and share ideas this afternoon with one of our um, afternoon activities. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Jean. You're muted. There we go. Okay. Mouse troubles too. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to uh, introduce and um, welcome five new members of the ESP program for 2021 uh, from Clockwise, from the right, Marathon Pipeline LLC in Claremont area actually has 11 sites covering several states, or I'm sorry, several counties uh, in Indiana. Um, they are our first um, pipe, uh, uh, petroleum transportation uh, member, um, which is really exciting. Um, most uh, they'll they'll be doing a lot of work on um, landscape conservation, which is my kind of pet peeve. I love it. <laughs> so I'm really grateful to see that uh, some of the fellow land around their sites are actually going to fall into some more uh, pollinator gardens and that kind of thing. So that's really nice. Um, Arvin Sango down in Madison, Jefferson County uh, became a member this year. Also Campbell Hospitality in Jasper, they're in Bois County. Cummins Technical Center in Columbus, Indiana, that's in Bartholomew County, adding another one of the Cummins uh, folks to our family. And then up in the upper uh, left corner, uh, Marathon Pipeline LLC again. Uh, this time the Griffith area has three sites there in Lake County. They just squeezed in to 2020 as a new member. Um, that makes, uh, a total of 51 members. Part of the reason why there's a change in membership, uh, maybe a little less than there was last year, is due to the fact that, in, sadly, there were three closures, facility closures this year, um, and members leaving. One another member left the program. And then also, um, our first corporate member uh, has come into play. So. Three Kimball facilities, the Jasper and Salem offices, as well as Kimball Hospitality, and two national office furniture facilities in Jasper and Santa Claus have combined to become our first corporate member, Kimball International. So um, the numbers may look a little less, but there's still a lot of us there, and I am so grateful to have everyone uh, included. We continue to grow. Uh, and uh, these new members are um, are going to contribute quite a lot in the next in next number of years. Next slide, please. So.
so with that in mind, um, the ESP program started back in, I think it was like 2007. Um, at that time, there were 14 reporting members. There are still 11 reporting members uh, as part of the ESP family. Um, I wanna thank you all for uh, your continued commitment. Um, you can see here on this slide, uh, they are Depew, Raytheon, Toyota Material Handling, Cummins Midrange Engines, Engine Plant, sorry, PMG Center Forged Products, Mead Johnson Nutrition, Toy Toyota Motor Manufacturing of Indiana, Toyota Boshoku of Indiana, Baxter Pharmaceutical, Alonco Clinton Labs, and A. Ramon Tinnerman. Thank you guys again for uh, being so committed and uh, being part of this program for so many years. I really appreciate that. So we know that 2020 was a very difficult year um, for all of us. Um, and yet members still were able to make significant strides in reducing pollution at their facilities um, by taking more taking some proactive steps and driving environmental improvements through their environmental management systems, 53 members of ESP achieved the following accomplishments in 2020. There was a reduction of close to 700,000 pounds of air emissions. We conserved over 4.87 million kilowatt hours in electricity conserved over 21 billion therms in natural gas and conserved over 8.7 million gallons in water. Next slide, please. Also, next slide. Also, uh, members were able to recycle 1.7 million pounds of materials reduced 10.5 thousand pounds of hazardous waste, they eliminated almost 8 million pounds of solid waste out of their processes, and we also preserved seven acres of land and habitat, of course. Thank you so much, members. Next slide. I'd like to say that these, this data uh, actually um, came from the ESP Annual Performance Reports, or APRs, uh, that were submitted from our members um, due April 1st of each year. Uh, these were ones that were submitted in 2021 to include all the calendar year 2020 pollution reduction initiatives. Um, Jennifer? Thank you, Jean. So we do have a nice opportunity this year. We have been revamping our Clean Community Challenge program. And as part of that revamp, we have opened up our voluntary leadership program rule. And while that is not always a fun thing to do um, as an agency, it is necessary to uh, remove some of the previous requirements that were for that program. And with that, we have an opportunity to expand um, some things with the ESP program or just slightly modify them. So we are um, we're taking a look at the EMS requirement for this program. Um, this is, um, you know, we do know that this is a standard that we want to um, still maintain um, as far as our, um, you know, a, a level playing ground um, amongst our members. Um, however, there are some, we've encountered some opportunity with uh, other standards that are out there that may be available for us to also have within our rule that would allow us to um, open the door to other industries. Um, we have, uh, we know that we have a limiting factor on the number of members that could join this program by currently um, only accepting those with an environmental management system. And we know there's around 178 
uh, folks in Indiana that have some sort of environmental management system in place. We recently met with the um, United Alliance for Printers and they do have a standard um, that, that's a sustainable uh, sustainability standard that would also, um, that's pretty stringent. And also um, we are looking at that to see if that might be a possibility of adding um, certain standards like that to our list of available um, EMS requirements or, or standard requirements for admission into the program. We are open to your ideas uh, related to that. Um, if you have thoughts or concerns, please do let us know that information. We have a place in the evaluation uh, for you to comment on that. Um, but that is our thought at this point to, um, to try to look at other industry standards to potentially add those to our rule. The other piece that we would like to uh, simplify is the renewal requirements. Currently under our rule, it requires us to go through a complete um, application round type of renewal as if you were joining for the first time. And we know that that's not the case. Um, many of you have repeatedly had renewals and um, even after, if if you enter into the program and have four years in the program, it really shouldn't require us to do the same level of um, dive into your application as it would at the start of the program. So we would like to modify that piece. And I think that alleviates some of the um, time and uh, maybe some worry on your end um, with that thought of simplifying that renewal. So we hope that that would be a great change for, for you all. Um, and as I said, if you have any thoughts about the rule, um, the rule is listed on the ESP website and they, there are multiple rules because um, they are under each of the um, program area uh, rule listings. And so each one of those rules is currently open. Um, we have uh, gone to first notice of the rulemaking and we are open to your comments and your input. So if you have other items that you think need to be altered within that rule, please do let us know. And Jean has, will provide the link in the chat as well for you to, um, to put that into the evaluation. And Jean's going to cover the incentives piece. Okay, yeah, so the other uh, item that we're looking into and reevaluating are the ESP incentives. Um, the state form 53706 has not been updated since 2009. And since that time, some of the incentives listed there have become standard practices available to all applicable permit holders. Things such as the FESOP and MSOP 10-year air permit renewal term, uh, streamlining FESOP and Title V air permit renewals, and streamlining and expediting the NPDES renewals. Um, also, assigning the same permit writer and or inspector uh, is no longer guaranteed because of staff shortages um, and can only be used when feasible. So um, anyone that has those items listed or is expecting to have the same permit writer or inspector, that's not always possible. Um, with all of that, as we review this form, I'm asking that our members please take a moment uh, to respond to the survey question on the meeting evaluation survey. Let us know your ideas of any incentives that you think would be worthy uh, to add to that 
form um, and allow you as the environmental stewards a um, few more perks um, to uh, and thanks from us uh, for all the commitments and activities that you've done. I'm also uh, going to, um, yeah, well, the, uh, I, I'll just let you know that the ideas that you, we get from you will definitely be evaluated and they'll be, make a determination as to whether or not they can also be added to the state form. Hopefully we'll see an updated form sometime next year. Um, we are also wanting to um, ask or request from our members um, something else. Um, we, you can help greatly um, if you were to go out and locate your incentive form and or the incentive approval letter uh, that you had received just around the time of your acceptance to ESP. Re take that form and then review the incentives that you requested and approved and were approved against your current permits and the recent inspections uh, that you've had. If you run into any issues about that, please do contact me um, by phone or email. Uh, that way then we can research those and correct any of the errors that may come about. Uh, realize that many of these incentives do involve modifications to the permit uh, so that uh, you may best to look for uh, applications you put in for those modifications um, to make those changes and add those incentives to your permit. Um, I hope that uh, it, we're currently internally uh, taking some time to look at permits at this point uh, to see if the incentives that had been listed on the forms were in fact uh, listed in the permits, um, but we really could use your help uh, individually to take some time to check your permits to see if those incentives did in fact uh, become part of that. Uh, also too, again, as I mentioned before, if you did ask for say 24 hour notice for inspections and you found that you were not receiving that notice, again, that's another item that we would like to hear about so that we can make sure that we can at least get the incentives you've asked for um, together. And again, please fill out the evaluation question. We really appreciate your ideas. Um, and uh, hopefully by next year, we'll have a new incentive form that we can send out to everyone. Thank you. Next slide. With that, if there are any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Again, I think a link has been posted to the chat for the evaluation survey. Uh, take some time, please, to fill that out. Uh, you can uh, begin now and just leave it open and make your um, uh, responses as we move along throughout the meeting, or if it's easier for you to wait until after. Uh, we really, really appreciate your input and hope that uh, we get a lot of good responses this time. Thanks. Jennifer. Okay. Sorry about that. Just trying to see if our guest is on here. All right. Does anyone have any questions? Nope. 
any thoughts about um, the changes to the rule? Any suggestions at this point? I um, think that the changes to the, the rule that you talked about in the part of the ESP, is that what you're asking specifically around or, or the air mm -hmm. emissions form? So um, I've been around a while and noticed that a lot of people have moved away from the traditional environmental management system because a lot of larger companies maybe have a sustainability process that is driven down to set goals around environmental. So those two um, are kind of two different pieces of it. So I find that you can drive your environmental improvements through some of the same sustainability targets that are signed on usually in 10 year increments. And there is substantial tracking and validation to those internally within the organization. So it would be nice to not have the EMS requirement with those things in mind. Okay, great. Good to hear. Okay. I believe we have Bruno joining us now. And let's see if he can get on here. All right. So it is our pleasure to um, have Bruno join us today. He um, is our commissioner of the Department of Environmental Management, for those of you that are new to the program. And he uh, was appointed by Governor Eric Holcomb in 2017. He joined IDEM in 2000 and um, served most recently as the chief of staff from August 2015 to December 2016. And then uh, prior to that, he had served in, as an assistant commissioner in the Office of Water Quality from 2005 to 2015. And prior to that, many numerous roles in the Office of Water Quality. So just a long history with IDEM. And I'll, most of you probably know him and his face, um, but I'll turn it over to you, Bruno. Thank you for joining us today. Well, uh, thanks so much, Jennifer. And I wanna say thanks to you and to Jean and all the folks at the agency who've worked so hard to put um, this on and Ben McKnight and, and all of the folks in, in the ESP program. I really appreciate um, the good work that's being done here. And, also, I appreciate the opportunity to take a little time to be with you guys. I, you know, I run around with my head cut off most of the time going to different meetings and so forth. So it's good to be able to touch base with you folks. So I'm going to do a little presentation if that's okay. Um, and I'm going to um, share my screen and uh, host. Oh, it says host is disabled. Uh, participant screen sharing is that go ahead something? and try now I've, I've changed oh. that setting for you okay let me try it again um, oh there we go okay good um, all right we're gonna share this uh, can you see uh, my my screen uh, I can't tell if you guys can we can see it but it's not in presentation mode and that's what I'll switch it to right away. Uh, okay, now you okay. can see it just fine? Looks great, thank you. Great, uh, so I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about our state level priorities and legislation um, in a changing environmental and social landscape. We, um, you know, established priorities for the agency uh, every year. And some people, so I'm always asked to come to present about it, it, uh, what our priorities are this year or, or what have we accomplished. And it had to occur to me the other day when I was thinking about things, well, 
not only what are our priorities, but why do we choose the priorities we choose? And how are they chosen? Because, you know, frankly, um, there are a lot of ways to, and a lot of things to work on. And the priorities are really just the things that are at the top of the list um, that we choose to work on. But uh, the question, if I'm watching a commissioner at our agency talk would be about, well, why, why are you choosing the things you're choosing? And I started to think about, well, isn't there some sort of uh, analogy that we can draw to something that we can relate to? And uh, I think of art and art history. And so I'm gonna veer way off of the environmental topic for a moment here and talk a little bit about art. I don't know um, how many of you visit an art museum. I don't go all that regularly. Oftentimes when I do go, I'm the kind of person who goes for a specific exhibit and maybe I go and I get through part of it and my stomach starts to grumble and I start to think about maybe they have a cafeteria or maybe I'm looking at something and I'm thinking, well, you know, it would be great. I bet my mom would like it if I got her a poster from this exhibit. And I'm thinking about the gift shop or the coffee shop or some other thing. And I start to walk through exhibits without looking too closely um, at the exhibits. Um, and so what do I get when I walk through an art museum? I get a sense of the things that they chose to put up on the wall. And those are their priorities. Um, but do I really understand why they put up the things they put up on the walls or have in the middle of the room or wherever? And how do I understand what I'm looking at? And I'll use an example to highlight this. Um, it, this all um, made me think that really context is everything. Art needs to be socialized and, and you need a lot of context to understand that. And it doesn't mean just reading a few art history books. And I thought that was a really brilliant quote by a guy named Peter Brandt, who was an industrialist, but he also uh, made enough money that he could collect art. And it seems like he's saying, you know, you can't view art uh, without understanding the context in which it's created. Um, and it occurred to me, well, what kind of example can we use for that? And uh, I think about this painting. And I look at it, and if I were walking through the way I typically walk through an art museum and looking at the paintings, I might walk right past this, especially if I think uh, I'm going to go get that cup of coffee or my lunch or go, go visit the gift shop and notice that it looks like there's a bunch of people sitting around a, a, a campfire and there's a guy in a red robe um, talking about it. And maybe... Um, you know, they're telling ghost stories or something. Anyway, that's what I think of when I see this. And I think, well, okay, if I were walking through an art museum, that's what I would see. Um, and especially if I were on my way to the coffee shop and it wouldn't really strike me um, and I wouldn't really understand it because I wouldn't have any context for looking at it. And if I decided, well, how am I going to understand this painting as opposed to just looking at the painting as I walked by toward the coffee shop, but I really wanted to understand it. What would I do to understand it? Well, first thing I would do is I'd look at the title of the painting. You know, when you go to an art museum, there's always a little square that has the name of the painting, the, uh, and uh, the artist and, and when it was done. And so in this case, I'd look at it and I might say, well, okay, so it's somebody named Wright of Derby um, and that's in England. And uh, the title is weird. It's a philosopher giving a lecture at the Orrery. And then it was done in 1765. And so if I'm on my way to the coffee shop, uh, I might read that and think, well, okay, uh, that, that's interesting. I don't know what that means, but still looks like a guy talking around a campfire and a bunch of kids listening and other people listening to a story. Um, but if I were to look a little closer, I would think about things. And I think about, well, 
one of the things I notice is that it's pretty realistic in its detail. Um, it's not like one of those Picassos where the arms and the heads are all disjointed and put in different locations. So it's, it's really um, clear, it's really proportioned. It looks realistic. It almost looks like you could do a photo. Um, uh, and uh, the color is cool and uh, it's realistic. Um, and then I think about the title, a philosopher giving a lecture on an orrery. And if I were really thinking about it, I might try to figure out what is an orrery. And I might look it up because generally speaking, I might wouldn't, I wouldn't have any knowledge of what an orrery was. And I realized that an orrery is a model of the solar system. And that gives me a little more information about the painting. And it's a philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery. So a philosopher is a teacher. And so this is really a painting of a teacher giving a lecture about a model of the solar system. And the light that's emanating from that isn't a campfire light, but it's a lamp that's set in the center of this model of the solar system to act like the sun. And all of a sudden I have a deeper understanding of what that painting means because I understand certain things from the title. But if I was to think about the date that the painting was done, 1765, I'd also realize that um, in 1765, what was going on in the world? Well, in 1765, it was part of the age of the enlightenment. And in the age of the enlightenment, science was becoming um, at the forefront of everything, of art, of history, of even religion, science started to take a much bigger place. And so it's no surprise then that the realism of this painting um, is, is evident because at that time, even the artists were trying to be realistic and scientific in their approach, drawing a rational painting, not some kind of Picasso-esque thing. And everything's fairly clear. And the whole topic is about science. So now all of a sudden I have a better idea of what this painting is about, because I understand that in 1765, there was um, the age of the enlightenment, and this is a teacher, and he's teaching about a scientific principle. Um, and in 1765, there were other things happening. Let me skip over those things. If you understand the importance of the times, you understand that the enlightenment was a, a, a time of reason, of rational questioning and science. It was preceded by the scientific revolution and the books of, uh, of Newton's principle, which deal not just with gravity, but the masses of planets. Um, philosophers at this time, Voltaire and Rousseau, held that everything could be rationally made demystified. Um, and Christians even sought to reposition their faith, faith along rational lines. So uh, when you look at this painting, understanding the times, instead of just seeing a guy standing around a campfire telling a story, what I understand now is this was a perfect thing to paint for their times because it was the age of the enlightenment when science was taking the four and that things were taking place. It was, uh, 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 and the reason it's hanging on a museum wall is it's, a, it's an example of how not just painters were painting things or the color or the realism, but also it's an example of what was going on at that time. What were the key things that were the context of their times. Um, so you understand a lot more by, understand, by understanding the context of the times. And I think just like art, environmental issues today are shaped by our times. So what kinds of uh, things are happening that shape our environmental issues? I'm gonna go through some pictures that show some of the signs of our times. Well, and, and the first one is this, that you know, we've been enduring over the past couple of years, a pandemic. And 
uh, we're all masked up. And not only are we all masked up, but we're keeping a social distance. Um, and most of the folks during the last couple years were out of the office. They were teleworking and doing remote work. Um, and um, our offices, and this is a picture I stood on a desk at the office, um, were pretty much vacant. I think 95% of the people in the agency were working from home. And so when you looked at IDEM, this is where you look to find the people on our computer screens, whether it was Zoom or Teams or some other thing. And we would meet regularly and, and talk through our issues. Um, and, and sometimes even our pets would join the conversation. So the pandemic was a sign of the times. And the question you'll have is, well, how did that affect the work you do? And how does it affect the priorities that are the environmental priorities that your agency is doing. So one of the signs of the times is the pandemic. Another was the murder of George Floyd um, and it sparked protests throughout the country. Um, and even here in Indianapolis, this is a picture of protesters that were marching down the street during, um, after, during the nationwide protests over the murder of George Floyd. And these are protesters that were standing at a monument circle. And like in some other places, there were some unfortunate uh, incidences where um, storefronts uh, were uh, destroyed or the front uh, glass was hurt um, as a result. Um, so the protests that occurred after the murder of George Floyd had an impact on our agency as well. It's the second indicator, the second sign of the times that impacted the focus of environmental issues for us. What's another one? A third one was this, uh, an election. In 2020, there was, and it seems like a little while ago now, an election, and it was a heated election. Uh, the incumbent president, President Trump, was running for re-election, um, and he was, um, running against uh, the former vice president, uh, Joe Biden. There were uh, debates that were held. Um, the elections uh, were contentious, but a ton of Americans uh, showed up at the polls to register their preference. Um, the second place finisher in this election, Donald Trump, earned more votes than anybody in the history of uh, American elections except for the first place finisher, Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden is now our president. And just after the, uh, uh, that, there, were, there was the incident at, at the Capitol building where protesters uh, broke into the Capitol um, in, in an insurrection. Finally, uh, the new president, President Biden was inaugurated um, at the federal government. Here at the local level, at the state level, we had an election too. And I'm proud to say Governor Holcomb was reelected. Um, and in addition to that, the Indiana General Assembly uh, had a supermajority in both uh, of Republicans in both um, the Senate and the House. Um, and thanks to the Indiana Hospital Association that put together this nice graphic that shows the breakdown of uh, Democrats and Republicans in both the House and the Senate. So those are big signs of the times and they affect um, the priorities that we have at the agency. Question is, what are the priorities that follow from these events? Um, the priorities um, in light of these changing times are the following. Continued focus on great government service during the COVID pandemic. Equity inclusion following the protests and the murder of George Floyd. Um, and national issues that a new administration has brought onto the plate and state legislation as well. And I'll talk about these priorities next. First, great government service during COVID. As I indicated from the pictures, most of the folks at IDEM 
worked at home during the pandemic. Um, but um, it, IDEM continued to issue our permits in a timely manner. We continued to issue them within our timeframes and, and actually well below. Our inspections uh, continued. Uh, our focus was on inspecting drinking water and wastewater facilities, and they were a priority because of the impact they have on public health. IDEM during the pandemic did not issue any blanket waivers from environmental rules. Um, and I'm proud to say that facilities overall continued to meet their obligations under their permits um, to protect the environment. And where facilities had difficulty meeting specific requirements, uh, IDEM handled them on a case by case basis. Most of those difficulties were really about submitting reports in a timely manner. And I would just say that um, where uh, facilities had trouble submitting those reports, they would send us notification and we would uh, give them the time that they needed. Uh, we wouldn't say that there wasn't a violation, but we also wouldn't take enforcement action because their report was a little late. So during the COVID pandemic, we continued our efforts to provide great government service to Hoosiers and the businesses uh, around the state to ensure the protection of the environment. Now, what about our work on um, resulting because the priorities that we had resulting from the protests from the George Floyd murder? Well, there became a renewed interest in equity and inclusion throughout the nation, but also in Indiana um, after the protests over the murder of George Floyd. Governor Holcomb in a speech said, we now stand at an inflection point and we have an opportunity to acknowledge those past wrongs, learn from our history and admit where we've come up short of our ideals. Then we must get about doing what we've done whenever we face a challenge, make historic progress together. So what does that historic progress together mean in terms of equity and inclusion, and how does it affect the Department of Environmental Management? Well, first, at the state level, it meant that Governor Holcomb created a cabinet position, a new cabinet position, the Chief Equity, Inclusion, and Opportunity Officer. Um, in the focus for the new cabinet member, is on improving equity, inclusion, and opportunity across all state government operations, including the Department of Environmental Management. Kara Herring, a law professor at um, Notre Dame, was selected to be the state's first ever chief equity, inclusion, and opportunity officer. And she's been working with state agencies to identify weaknesses in terms of hiring, remove barriers to equity within agencies, and uh, promote equity and inclusion among the state agencies in Indiana. So what about IDEM? What are we doing regarding equity and inclusion? Well, we're working with CARA on equity and inclusion issues. I conducted some listening sessions with IDEM employees of color to discuss their perception of the agencies. I, IDEM has also been working on uh, environmental justice issues. Um, we have maps that highlight areas of the state that might be considered environmental justice areas. We've been working with uh, Indiana University to have them review and enhance uh, the maps we put together. And we've been working with the governor's office on environmental justice uh, policies. And uh, those policies are, um, are ones that are also being pushed at, at the federal level by US EPA in a new focus on environmental justice issues. Um, they are uh, requesting that agencies across the nation conduct holistic environmental assessments of an area um, that might be considered an environmental justice area. While they don't have prescriptions about exactly how to conduct those analyses and what the end result of those analyses are, they 
uh, in a first step are asking agencies to look in those areas and conduct an analysis, not just an air analysis or a water analysis or a land analysis, but a holistic analysis to see whether or not residents in what might be considered environmental justice areas are disproportionately impacted by uh, pollution because of their proximity to industrial facilities. Uh, we're engaged in discussions within the agency to talk about how we might do those kinds of uh, efforts. And it, it's something we don't traditionally do. We've also been working hard to uh, hire uh, a, a diverse workforce within the agency. So uh, that's where we are in terms of equity and inclusion. What uh, did what impacts did the 2020 election have? on national environmental issues. First of all, as I mentioned, there are issues that cross all the different media. And when I say media, I mean air, land, and water across uh, the agency. Environmental justice is clearly one of them. And EPA um, is looking at enforcement and environmental justice as well, conducting more inspections in areas that might be considered environmental justice areas is one area that EPA is considering. The 2020 elections also will likely have an effect on the priorities we choose for the Office of Air Quality in regard to uh, climate issues. As you know, this administration at the federal level is very concerned about climate change. I expect that over the next three years, US EPA will be developing regulations um, to, um, uh, that might be somewhat similar to the Clean Power Plan uh, regarding um, efforts on climate. Um, but also um, we as an agency have been working to redesignate Northwest Indiana for ozone. We're putting together packages for uh, redesignating Northwest Indiana as in attainment of the 2008 ozone standards, and then the um, Louisville, Kentucky area as in attainment of the 2008 and 15 ozone standards. And that's important because it, uh, it allows for business expansion in that area. And third, the 2020 uh, uh, elections affected national environmental issues in terms of water. Waters of the United States has been, and the definition of what is a waters of the United States has been a, a, a subject of contention that has bounced back and forth over the last uh, 12 to 15 years. Under, um, uh, before the, the Obama administration, there were lawsuits that were filed that went to the Supreme Court, um, which made a ruling regarding uh, what is a waters of the United States. The Obama administration came out with uh, a, a, a rule that sought to define waters of the United States more clearly. And then the Trump administration overturned it and then sought to install their own definition of waters of the United States, which has been uh, held up uh, through the courts and now the Biden administration will be working on a redefinition of waters of the United States. Uh, this, this is really uh, an uncertain area that affects impacts to wetlands. And the back and forth regarding the waters of the United States issue has led to greater uncertainty. Um, and I think EPA will be working to create a more durable rule, one that doesn't go back and forth and change uh, with the changing winds of the, of the politics in Washington. In addition to that, there was a rulemaking that was put in place that is under consideration by the Biden administration regarding what we call our 401 or water quality certification rules. And the process is largely process oriented that included timeframes for issuing our 401 certifications. By state law, we're required to do them in 90 days. Or, or some such thing. So um, we're working uh, on that, but we're also watching US EPA's reconsideration of the 401 rulemaking. Um, but 
in addition to that, the elections on the state level had an impact as well. And primarily during the last legislative session with wetlands. Wetlands um, is an issue that <coughs> can be somewhat confusing. It involves uh, a series of regulated entities that is really broad. It's not just large companies that are well aware of the regulations, but involves individuals that own property that may not be as familiar with what a wetland is and what is required if they need to impact that wetland. In this last legislative session, with a supermajority uh, of Republicans, um, a couple of legislators introduced Senate and uh, what eventually became Senate Enrolled Act 389. Uh, Senate Enrolled Act 389 was initially proposed to eliminate state protection of wetlands altogether. After meeting uh, repeatedly with the uh, authors of that legislation, it was changed and that uh, change uh, removed protections for class one wetlands, uh, created exemptions from impacts to some class two wetlands, but continued the protection of class three wetlands. And if you're not familiar with wetlands, you might ask, well, what is a class one, a class two and a class three wetlands? And when I think about it, I think of class three wetlands as those wetlands that are the most um, precious that are forested. So you might see a wooded area and that have the appropriate soils and water cover to be considered wetlands. Those wetlands are the most um, important wetlands to preserve. Class two wetlands are somewhere uh, um, less protective than that. They may cont can contain some uh, forested areas and then areas that aren't. They're not as quite as important. And class one wetlands are often considered uh, scrub wetlands, or maybe they have the soils, but not a, a lot of other characteristics of wetlands. A wetland, by the way, isn't just um, an area that is covered in water. It, it, it can be uh, containing the soils that uh, comprise uh, wetland soils. And it can oftentimes look like farmland or other material. And a lot of that of those areas that don't necessarily look like wetlands are called class one wetlands. So um, this bill was introduced, um, it went through some changes and I've mentioned the changes and it was signed into law. Um, and therefore um, the state legislation really focused us on environmental protection of wetlands. Um, in addition to that, during the last legislative session, the energy industry, which currently uh, has um, byproducts of its uh, electric generating facilities that include coal ash, and they put that coal ash, which comes from burning coal to create electricity, into big ponds on their, on their property. Um, IDEM, regulates the closure of coal ash ponds. If a coal ash pond is no longer going to be used, we must approve the plans for closing those ponds. And that closure can in include solidifying that those ponds and leaving the coal ash in place or removing the coal ash from those ponds altogether. Legislation was introduced during the last legislative session at the state level and it was called SCA 271, which mandated that IDEM would apply to not only regulate the closure of coal ash ponds, but also regulate and permit coal ash ponds that continue to operate. US EPA was beginning to regulate this program and the energy industry was more interested in IDEM holding the reins of the regulations and therefore we um, under Senate Enrolled Act 271 were uh, required to apply to uh, US EPA to conduct the regulatory activities for those coal ash ponds that continue to remain open. 
So we're working to conduct a rulemaking necessary to adopt federal regulations and apply for delegation of the coal ash ponds. Let me talk about a couple other state initiatives that we're engaged in because of surrounding circumstances. Um, a state initiative that we've been focused on is PFAS. PFAS, what is PFAS? It's a, a group of thousands of unregulated man-made chemicals that are found in hundreds of products from the rain jacket that you wear to the Teflon pans, to the fast food wrappers, even the, the wrapper of, um, of a popcorn bag um, contains PFAS and dental floss. Um, and they're, they're really useful chemicals because one of the things they do is keep water out of things. You don't want um, the, the butter that's in that uh, microwave popcorn to leak out of the bag when you're popping it in your microwave. So uh, they put these chemicals in the bag so that the, 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 the butter wouldn't leak out. They put this stuff in, in our jackets so that it would protect us from the rain. They're the most extensively um, used products in a variety of different ways that I can think of. And they are um, uh, PFOA and PFOS, and they're uh, also known as forever chemicals because they persist in the environment for a long way. EPA currently does not have any drinking water standards for PFOS chemicals. And because they don't have drinking water standards, we cannot um, require that drinking water systems uh, remove or have limits on the amount of PFAS that they have in, in the water that is, is delivered to people's homes. They did, EPA did establish health advisory levels for PFO and PFAS, which is 70 parts per trillion. Um, those health advisory levels are not enforceable um, and they're not regulatory. In addition to that, the US uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Control Registry publishes toxicological profiles about, um, and they call these uh, minimal risk levels, which is an estimate of the amount of chemical that a person can eat, drink, and breathe without a detectable risk to health. They're just screening levels. They're not regulatory in nature. So. EPA is working to establish um, maximum contamination levels for drinking water facilities that will be able to regulate the amount that is in our, uh, our waters. But the first step is for us and other states to determine, well, what are the levels of PFAS regardless of whether or not there's standards in place that's in our drinking water? So uh, IDEM has, as one of its initiatives, worked to uh, determine what the levels are in our drinking water across the state. We have taken the initiative to sample systems, drinking water systems, in three phases all around the state. Phase one, which is underway now, is sampling 123 systems that serve between 3,000 and 10,000 people. Phase two, we'll be looking at 570 systems serving less than 3,000 people. And then phase three, we'll be looking at the big systems in the state, 85 systems that serve more than 10,000 people. IDEM is uh, collecting samples from both the raw, that's the water that's delivered to the facility, and the finished water, the water that enters people's homes. We're going to collect over 3,000 uh, samples in this effort, I have the sense that what we'll, we'll find is yes, we'll find detections of PFAS, but they will be um, fairly low. Other states have conducted the same kind of analysis, Kentucky and Michigan and Illinois, and are finding that there are only low levels uh, of this uh, chemical combination in our waters. Uh, we are also working with the Ohio River Sanitation Commission. Uh, because uh, we're seeking to understand better what the levels of PFAS are in the Ohio River. And as a member of the Ohio River Valley Sanitation Commission, and as a uh, commissioner in that commission, I've been working uh, with the other commissioner members to partner with the US EPA to look at PFAS in the Ohio River. 
uh, this study that we're conducting that's ongoing right now, it looks at 13 PFAS compounds. And the survey is going to characterize the ambient conditions for the whole 951 mile Ohio River, not just Indiana's portion of it. Um, and we're looking at and have a very scientific approach to looking at PFAS concentrations. We're looking at 20 different locations all along the river using a probabilistic approach that will tell us what the ambient water quality is like. Uh, we're partnering with EPA on the analytical component because they have a very good scientific group in Cincinnati that will analyze the samples. And we're working with USGS to use a sample collection method that helps look at the levels of PFAS at the bottom of the river, in the middle of the river, at the top of the river, and throughout the river. This effort is ongoing. It'll give us more information about what PFAS looks like in the environment. I've, uh, I've talked for quite a while now about the priorities that we're having. And, and so one of the things I just wanna leave you with is that I recognize that when I come and speak to people, people, hear about the priorities and the things that we're working on that are at the top of the list. It doesn't mean those are the only priorities we have, but they're the ones we're really focused on at, at this moment. And when we choose to focus on those, it's oftentimes outside circumstances um, that, and, and a sign of the times that focus us on those things. PFAS on the Ohio River uh, in, and PFAS in general, it's an emerging issue throughout the country. We chose to focus on it because it's a focus for the whole nation. The equity and inclusion efforts that are ongoing at the state of Indiana are due to the sign of the times and the protests that I can directly connect to um, the murder of George Floyd in the other priorities that were putting in place, the protection of wetlands, our reaction to both the federal elections and uh, the state elections. So when we talk about our priorities, the priorities we choose to work on are not just the priorities that we choose or, or pull out of thin air, but come from the events of, what, uh, uh, of the nation and the state. And they really push us to do the different work uh, that we're working on. I will say there are a lot of other important ones that we're following. Um, one of the other areas is nutrients and uh, nutrients is a big issue around and has been for several years. Um, nutrient issues like phosphorus and nitrogen loadings to our waterways is something that we've been focused on because, um, well, in 2014, the Ohio, uh, 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 Ohio suffered through an incident where Toledo, Ohio received high levels of algal growth in their drinking water system that forced them to shut down their drinking water for the whole city of Toledo, Ohio uh, for a weekend before they could clean out this stuff. And that the algal growth was a direct relationship to the phosphorus levels that are high in Lake Erie. And where's the phosphorus coming from in Lake Erie? It's coming from the, uh, the, the, the basin, uh, the Lake Erie Basin of which we are a part, including uh, the St. Mary and St. Joe's um, River. So a lot of different priorities. No one is the most important, but the times really focus us in certain areas. And uh, I just wanted to let you know what they are, what we're working on, and tell you how much I appreciate your partnership with us in, in tackling these priorities. Not only are we doing regulatory priorities, however, we're doing non-regulatory activities as well. And I just wanna say the ESP efforts, the recycling initiatives, and all of the initiatives through clean communities and, and others that we're working on show that there's a commitment on the part of the members of ESP, the members of clean communities and others to make a difference on our environment and in our environment. And without your efforts, any progress on environmental issues would not be possible. So today it's important 
for me to say thank you for your efforts and your priorities because they're making a difference. And they're making a difference that ensures that our air, water, and land are cleaner than ever before. And while we face new challenges and there's always going to be a new pollutant that comes down, I know we can meet those challenges because we've got you working to protect the environment. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you for allowing me to come and share the priorities we're working on. And I look forward to working with you all in the future to protect our environment and allow for robust uh, economic growth. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Jennifer, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Yes, sir. All righty. And do we have any questions for Bruno? This is your opportunity. Every year we give you a chance. I got one from Anil Josie. Hi, Hi Anil. Anil. Hey, good morning, Bruno. It just my question is, you know, around the, the same um, things that you just uh, presented, you know, we have the social issue going on, environmental and governance. So a lot of the private entities are, you know, moving away from traditional ma management systems to a broader, um, you know, scale of environment, social and governance. Um, the investors hold us um, accountable to that, right? So is item aligning with private entities in that area or how's that working? You know, how's item seeing that as a progress, uh, you know, for, for private entities? Well, I, I think it, it's really important for item to align with private entities. Although I will say in, in some areas and environmental areas, private entities jump far ahead of the, uh, the agency at times. And one of the areas that I'm really proud of for uh, the, the private sector to work on is an area that was a big focus over the last couple of weeks, and that was the climate change issues. Uh, I've gone to many companies who are really focused on um, ensuring that they're not going to wait for governments to tell them, you know, reduce or to uh, affect the climate. They're going to take action themselves. I was at Cummins, a geez, I don't know, uh, a year ago or so, and went to their engine manufacturing plant. And those guys are moving toward electric engines, <laughs> Cummins, which is focused on, you know, diesel and. and non-diesel engines is moving. Um, and they're putting together plans to address climate issues in their own company, not waiting for regulations to come down the pike. So uh, that's an area, and I've, I've seen it too with other companies uh, and uh, a whole host of them. Um, but that's one example I can, uh, I can point to right off the bat, where I think we're not always aligned. And, and you know, that whether it's, IDEM or some other state or whatever. I think sometimes companies have the freedom to move a bit faster. They're not constrained by the political atmosphere that oftentimes uh, can slow or speed um, progress on environmental issues due to the nature of the elected officials that run the organizations. I, I'm, I just wanna say, I, I do know that where we're not, oftentimes uh, companies are in the lead. And that's, that's really heartening. It, it always makes me excited when I get to go to a, a company that's really doing amazing things. And just so many of you guys are. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be shy. Anybody else?
Okay, well, this, oh, I've got, somebody just raised their hand and lowered it. Okay. <laughs> if no other questions, uh, you can also put them in the chat if you need to do that, if you don't want to speak in front of everyone. No? Okay. Well, we appreciate Looks your time. Looks like Ben's got one there. Oh, Ben. Hey, hey, Jennifer, okay. I raised my hand. Yeah. Hey, Bruno. Hi, Ben. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Not bad. I, I just want to thank you very much for your support of all the programs that I do. I mean, uh, without the help uh, of uh, not only uh, Jennifer and Jean, but the rest of the staff uh, that's behind the scenes that do, that you don't get to see a lot of times, you know, the programs that, that I didn't have wouldn't be near as strong. So, you, you know, we appreciate the support of not only you and Jennifer and Jean, but everybody behind the scenes that makes things happen. So, uh, again, thank you. And, and it was a wonderful presentation. Well, Ben, uh, I, I too recognize uh, Jennifer and, and Jean's work. You know, uh, nothing happens without them. And so really anything we're doing that's good is little to do with me and mostly to do with them. <laughs> and that's just the truth. So I can't take any credit for it. They just make sure I get here on time and, and that I talk about what I'm working on, but they do all the heavy lifting. And you know, it's true across every program in our agency. And, and I'm really proud of the folks I work with over the 21 years I've worked at our agency, Ben, I've learned so much from people uh, that I don't know. And I would be remiss for not uh, acknowledging the contributions that everybody else makes here. I, I don't, I'm just a small part of this organization, um, but man, I, I really appreciate the work that Gene and Jennifer and everybody else does because they make it go. Uh, I couldn't do the recycling. I couldn't do uh, the programs that, that are being done in the Office of Program Support that all really push us to do more. And I'm just, every time I talk to them, I'm like, wow, you guys know a lot more than I do about this stuff. So I, I really appreciate it. Well, again, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. And, and Ben, thanks for being such a great partner. Well, no, I appreciate it. It's, it's kind of the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're a leader. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. Well, we, thank you very much, Bruno, for being here with us. And uh, we do appreciate your <laughs> thoughts and, and your um, presentation today. Well, all right. It's, uh, it's great to be with you guys. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. <coughs> yeah. So we are coming up on our lunch break. And we do have, we still have a technical issue in getting our folks from Canada on. So what I um, propose that we do is uh, I need to reset the meeting link and make sure that the settings are correct for them to join us this afternoon. So you will be receiving a new link from us um, in your email box here shortly. I'm going to go ahead and reset that. You'll have a little bit longer for, you, for your lunch break. Um, we will see, let's see here what our agenda says. Um, we'll see you back here at 12.30. And I, you, will, you will receive a new link to join us this afternoon. I apologize. Um, the setting, I think, got added after the, the meeting was created. So um, I don't want you to miss our fabulous speaker from Canada. And uh, thank you for bearing with us in this technical challenge. So look for the new link from us. And um, we'll see you all back here at 1230. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm.